Welcome to another episode of IntentWise Connect podcast, where we talk about all things Amazon, Walmart, e-commerce. I'm your host, Srinath Reddy, co-founder and CEO here at IntentWise. And really, our goal with these podcasts is to bring educational and informative content. And my guest today is Chris Mo. He is the co-founder and CEO of Cartograph. Cartograph is a full-service agency. We are here to do a deep dive on Prime Day performance. And in particular, we want to get a little deeper into some nuanced observations. But before we do that, Chris, it's great to have you. And do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself and, and your company? Sure, sure. Thank, first off, thanks for having me, Srinath. Really excited for this conversation. So like you said, I'm, I'm Chris Mo. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Cartograph. We're a full-service Amazon agency. We specialize in CPG. So what that means is food and beverage, supplements, health and beauty, pet products um, are, are really our, our core competency. We work with about 90 different brands, probably move around 300 million on the platform annually, spend around 40 million in advertising. We've been around for about six years now. Prior to Cartograph, I was a McKinsey consultant for about uh, five years and then uh, made the jump to working with emerging brands on Amazon. I've said this to you before, you're the only ex McKinsey person I know in our ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of us, but like hiding yeah. here and there, here and there. <laughs> what, what's that golden ice cream thing behind you, Chris? Oh, uh, this is this is kind of my signature Zoom background. It's actually a golden ice cream cone statue oh, that I picked up in, uh, in New York back when I lived there um, in Manhattan, just off the street. And it's uh, sort of become a little bit of a team mascot, something conversation starter, something a little bit interesting to, uh, you know, keep the calls lively. That's awesome. And you live in Austin, one of my favorite cities. I came to the U.S. a while back and I spent seven years in Austin, but I haven't been back. Unboxed is in Austin this year. That's right. That's yeah. right. We're, we're really excited for it. We're actually hosting... Um, invites aren't out yet. You are definitely invited. We're hosting a boat cruise happy hour or party the Tuesday of Unboxed. So I hope you'll yeah. be there. And if you're listening, message me if you want to join in the fun. That's awesome. Yeah. We've talked a few times. And another thing that jumped out for me in, in terms of your focus area that's a little bit unique, in my opinion, uh, with, your, with your company is your just extreme uh, view and focus on profitability of the brands. I know you have a very detailed PL statement that I, I remember seeing. You want to talk to that a little bit? Just like why that focus? I mean, it's obvious why one should focus on profitability, but you have made that your core focus and agenda and differentiator. So just speak to that a little bit, please. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> I mean, it, we, we started just because of, I think, the backgrounds of, of me and my co-founder, um, John. John had worked at um, a... Uh, subsidiary of General Electric and Consumer Electronics. Sure. And so they were always very profit focused in the way that they grew. Um, it was never a growth only kind of uh, organization. And then me working for McKinsey, it was always kind of like big picture profitability. Are we growing the business in a sustainable way? All that kind of stuff. I did some uh, distress turnarounds and so got to know um, pretty intimately the risks of not operating profitably. And so it's... um. Yeah, become a big part of our process and the way that we work. We set monthly goals for every brand, top line spend, and effectively a pro forma bottom line. And across our entire portfolio, you know, move in 20 to 30 million a month. Um, we hit it within 5% every month. Got it. And so really our objective is, can we set expectations and meet those expectations but it's also a measure of, do we actually know the business? Do we know what's going on? Do we know what kind of seasonality is coming? What our inventory position, what the comp competition is doing? What kind of promotions we have coming down the pipeline? Um, and so it's really a monthly test. And yeah. so I think full P&L is really important for that. In the last six years, we've gone through a few turbulent uh, phases in the world of e-commerce between the pandemic, iOS changes, uh, recent funding challenges, Amazon fee challenge. I mean, like every year, it's kind of something new. Yeah. And what, what I've found is the focus on full P&L and profitability makes our relationships with our clients endure a lot more. Because sometimes they're like, okay, we want to grow. We want to invest 20, 
um, into the platform. And then they're like, okay, we need to deliver 20% net profit on the yeah. platform. How can we do that? How can we shift product mix? How can we change the way that we merchandise and advertise to deliver that P&L? And so that's been really helpful in building long-term relationships with our clients. I want to come back to this topic of profitability, in which it drives a certain type of thinking and uh, tactics around Prime Day when you're optimizing for profitability. But we'll get to that later in the conversation. But let's dive into today's topic, which is Prime Day. A part of why we are here is because Chris has been sharing some almost you know, kind of real-time updates on how things are going on Prime Day, uh, which I learned a lot from. And I thought we get on this podcast and chat more. And by the way, if you don't already follow Chris, do so. <laughs> you will be educated. Uh, but let's uh, let's dive in. And it's almost passe now to say that, oh, Amazon has hit an all-time high with a Prime Day. I mean, that just happens with every Prime Day now. It's kind of boring to talk about that. But how do they do that? You know, they're running a ton of experiments. They're doing a lot of new things. I want to dig into that a little bit, Chris. Walk me through, uh, perhaps we can go uh, by different areas. Uh, let's start sure. with just the merchandising of the deals. What did you see that was different this time? Yeah, yeah, I, I think... It's uh, to your point, it's interesting to see what Amazon will do to hit the all time high. Yeah. And it kind of gives you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain of what they're prioritizing and, and changing things. So I think the most noteworthy thing that I observed was badging differences. So rewind the clock to last year, there were actually different badges for prime exclusive discounts for this kind of like baby blue, powder blue color. And then the deals have the red and they're, they're all kinds of different colors. This year, everyone had the bright red badges. And I think this was, this was a really interesting choice because it had the effect of doing a few different things. First off, um, participants versus non-participants in Prime Day was literally a red badge. Red badge. Um, and so it was very clear if you didn't participate and immediately it kind of like called out brands, particularly in like the sponsor brand banner on top. If you weren't participating, if you didn't have a red badge on all three facings, and we saw tons and tons of brands who did, didn't, it was actually kind of tricky to get it right. Um, it was very clear whether or not you were participating and I think really would, would drive performance. The other impacts though were First, it had the effect of de-emphasizing lightning deals a lot. And I think this is a really big deal. If you think back to uh, Prime Day historically, it's always been about new product discovery on a lightning deal that is very time bound. Yeah. That was way de-emphasized. It's an all day event. The badges stay on the whole day. They, they look the same regardless of discount amount. And so that era of, you know, the the limited time deal seems like it's getting a little bit de-emphasized. Um, I don't know yes. if you, you could believe that Amazon um, believes they can get larger total basket with yeah. um, a more broader, broad merchandising. Then the last thing I'll say though, with these badges is there were a lot of uh, posts on social that were claiming that Amazon deals are either weak or people had raised the prices before and then dropped the price. So the, the, uh, display discount was a lot more substantial than um, than what it actually was in effect. I actually think this was a byproduct of the badge being so uh, consistent across deals. Because basically last year it was like tiered where like the brighter stuff was the bigger discounts and the smaller stuff was, you know, lighter colors or so forth. And so I think it actually drove a little bit of customer confusion in a way um, that you couldn't tell which deals were going to be the good ones or the big ones. And so you ended up clicking and people were disappointed. <laughs> and uh, on that note, um, talk to me about the issue with price matching. And you mentioned this a little bit, but um, I'm curious, uh, you know, the impact on like, whether it's Chewy or Target, what what happened? What is the impact? What, why was it different this time? Yeah, so for, first the primer on price matching. So Amazon has a most favored nation pricing rule. Um, and basically all the brands that we work with are omni-channel. So they're in other retailers like a Walmart, a Target, a Sephora, a Petco, a Costco, um, uh, places like that. And so what Amazon says is they have the right to match the pricing of these other platforms at, at, at the same price. And if you don't do that, they'll suppress your buy box. Yeah. 
And in suppressing their buy box, they'll also suppress your deals. So this has kind of been a known issue for a couple years um, across platforms. And it's always, of course, been tricky because matching a Walmart price for in-store curbside pickup that doesn't include shipping doesn't exactly seem like a fair apples to apples. Sure. That said, in the last couple months, this has actually changed to get even more challenging for certain brands. First, it was Chewy, which is uh, the large pet uh, e-commerce retailer. They will actually match promo prices. Mm -hmm. And so what, what happens in effect is you run a promo on Amazon, Chewy matches that price. And then Amazon will basically deactivate your deal because it's not below yep. the other otherwise known prices. And so it actually was very hard for pet, uh, pet brands to, to do kind of your conventional discounting. And they had to come up with creative ways, run coupons, um, just do price strike throughs and so forth. Uh, this, this was a problem with Pet Day probably a month ago as well. Target with their um, new Target Plus rollout. They have started doing, they change the way that they do price matching. Like a lot of these e-commerce sites have kind of like the member specific pricing, which often they'll withhold from indexing. So it's not matched, but Target actually started matching deals as well. And so this all of a sudden throws a wrench in your ability to run a promo, throws a wrench in your ability to run discount. And basically for brands of, of reasonable size on Amazon, you know, if you're five to $10 million on Amazon, it's kind of becoming the standard and we recommend to have different assortment right. across the channels just because the price matching problem is um, just getting more and more difficult. And right there, I mean, that's a pretty big implication, right? In terms of thinking about their <laughs> channel allocation of their products, especially with large catalogs. Uh, those are a lot of choices for a brand to make. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, I think we all know that Amazon requires a little bit of a different assortment strategy, especially if you're a big brand, mm -hmm. you kind of have to pick your favorites. Consumers tend to like variety packs or multi-packs. It does make sense to have a specific strategy. Um, and it also happens to help with resellers too, which can be another challenge. True. But that said, yeah, it's expensive. It adds complexity. It's, it's not easy. Yeah. Discounts this year, like what did you see from a just... Any, any range you, you saw in particular and the level of discounting that, you know, across, par, across categories? <laughs> yeah. So I think what we saw in CPG is that average discounts were about 20 to 30%, which is yeah. kind of in line with what um, Amazon recommends uh, for Prime Day. That said, there were, I noticed more small discounts. Mm badge or, or you somehow found them in the in the prime day mix which i thought was um you know again contributes to this consumer perception of like the deals don't aren't, aren't hitting as hard this year we did notice a couple other things on discounting one it took like a 40 to 50 percent discount to really stand out some of our brands who, who did that were the ones that rather than having five to ten times average daily sales they were the 10 to 20 plus um, if you really wanted to find a bunch of new consumers and expose the brand, it was good for emerging brands. A cool thing this year was it was the first year that we've had first time subscribe and save uh, coupons. So coupons only offered to first time subscribers and basically we do all consumables. So this was a huge lever and it was kind of getting into the details. You could stack your prime deal with this and it wouldn't double count. It would like mm. exhaust the prime deal and then it would switch to this coupon. Um, and, you know, we we often will keep always on these coupons because we find them to be really valuable with, in terms of the lifetime value. But you could, what you could do is you could say, okay, we're, let's say 20% always on, we can double that. Sure. And that's, you know, the price of the prime day deal. And it ends up being a really good deal for the brands. Got you. I uh, want to dive into this topic of budget management, Chris, and it's such a top of mind topic during prime day. Am I running out of budgets? Am I setting the right budgets? Um, what did you see? And by the way, I'm when it comes to budget management, I'm on the camp for obvious reasons that like to me, running out of budgets, it doesn't matter what the circumstances is, is an absolute no-no. Because yeah. as you know, I mean, I can lower my bids, let the budget run longer, pay lower CPCs if I'm budget constrained. So, totally. but what did you see? Um in terms of budgets, uh, especially impacts competitively. 
Sure, sure. So yeah, I totally think of it the same way. The way the way I describe it to the team is like, let's lose for the right reasons. Yeah. Losing because you run out of budget is a bad yeah. reason to lose. It's a yeah. it's like a bad beat that yeah. they say in uh, in like the world of poker. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so. Yeah, we we definitely try to set budget controls with tech. I think that's really important. Basically, yeah. our team is not only setting budget guardrails that the tech uh, determines, but also manually checking to see yeah. like, okay, how are things pacing? It was, this year, there were a lot of tech issues. I mean, I think most people know the console went down for an yeah. hour or so on uh, the evening of the first day. In our observation, it didn't stop spend, but you can adjust during it. And so that's kind of like all the importance that you have adjustments being made through the day. We also heard some anecdotes of like a little bit of like unreliable or delayed data, kind of typical stuff you see with the API streams and so forth. So um, I think using tech was a big important part. Another was there's actually a lot of interesting... um, implications of saving budget for different parts of the day. So Prime Day really popped the early morning Pacific. That was kind of like the time that CBCs were the highest, spend and, and sales were the highest, but it was also like it tended to be a little bit less profitable. This is day one, right? You're talking about this day, is day one. one. Day yeah. one. And so you're you kind of have a choice, which is are you kind of like front running the the prime day sales and saying, okay, I'm going to be top of the heap because traffic is going to continue to grow and I get a bigger share if I go really quickly. So we had brands that um, spent early, particularly successful if they sent off Amazon traffic that actually spiked their exposure and then they, that carried through the day. So that was, that was one strategy. The other was we always really make sure to save budgets for the end of the day. Two reasons. Yeah. One is people who don't set good budget guidelines, they end up running out of budget partway through the day. Like all of Amazon is set on daily budgets. You run out of budget. Naturally, people are just uh, falling off. And so CBCs start to drop as you get towards the end of the day. The other thing a couple of our team uh, or a number of our team observed and talked about was what we call the the scrolling in bed FOMO spike, (laughs) which is at the end of each prime day in the evening, you see all of a sudden there's really good sales spikes as people are thinking, oh shoot, did I miss Prime Day? Yeah. I got to go shop. And so yeah. like 6 to 9 p.m. was another good time to reinvest and, and spend more of your budget. So yeah, I think I think budget controls throughout the days, um, You know, even if you're not doing like marketing stream driven day parting, you can just kind of observe and realize that people shop through the days differently. Yeah, I think from the day that marketing stream first came out, right, this has always been the pattern. You look at CPCs, even on a normal day, CPCs are just lower towards the end of the day, and that just gets dramatically amplified during prime day. So that's always been the case. I guess it continues to be the case. And to your point, uh, stream data is generally on a day like prime day. We've noticed that it's like two to three hour delayed, so you can't really act in real time anyway. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On the topic of technical issues, yes, so the ad console issues. But the interesting thing is at that time, the, um, the API updates from tech were going just fine. It's just that you had no visibility into whether they are working or not. But, so, <laughs> but we, we looked at ret- retroactively, everything was working fine. You just didn't know, <laughs> right, right, from an API perspective. Right, right. And it was scary. People were worried. Totally. LinkedIn was buzzing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Switching gears just slightly here, uh, as you know, Amazon released Rufus, their shopping assistant, widely, what, a couple of days before Prime Day. Big move. Curious about your thoughts on future implications of it. I know it's all early days. Um, not sure if you've played with it much, but uh, would just love to hear your perspective on, let's just say this became uh, mainstream in terms of adoption. What are the implications? Yeah, you know, it's it's pretty interesting. I mean, I think it's helpful to to zoom out and look at how the tech industry broadly is positioning AI. Yeah. And so what they're saying is basically it's kind of like a replacement to the Google search bar. In that rather than typing in a string that we've kind of learned how to write that Google reads well, 
Instead, you can just do like a common English question. And then the AI gives you more refined results. So the reason that there's so much money going to AI is because there's so much money that goes to search. And yeah. so if this could supplant it, um, it's valuable. But with that lens, it's kind of interesting because it's Amazon replacing Amazon. So it's Amazon search being replaced by Amazon. And so yeah. I think the way to think about it is Amazon actually already does a lot of AI, so to speak, uh, enhancements to just the ordinary search strings right now, right? Autocompletes, uh, you typed a typo, instead we put this item. Um, even, even like going further, you go down and search and they put related items, they put other stuff in category and stuff even not necessarily related to that individual search ranking. And so I think the way to think about it is it's actually just an enhancement of those, or like a refinement of those search refinements already. And so, I mean, really what it'll be for, for all of us Amazon marketers is revisiting what is important in SEO, what are the ways that consumers look for products in your category, and how can yeah. you make sure you're, you're optimized for that. And the good news is in the last year, Amazon's released a ton of data on yeah. what do consumers search? How do they find your products? You know, what is their path? Which search terms have you know more volume on clicks and conversions and all that good stuff in search query performance reports? So I think actually the data mining exercise is going to be pretty similar. It's just going to be, um, and there's a ton of smart people in the Amazon ecosystem already thinking about this, like what is the SEO of yep. Rufus that gets you in the new search result? Makes total sense. And also... Um, you know, personally, I'm intrigued by, or rather curious about how a couple of things get handled. One is, from what I can tell already, it's like um, you just see more branded searches being executed just the way it works, right? Like, hey, here's products from top brands and things like that. So what is the implication? Does that mean we go, we need to go spend a lot more money on brand defense in the future? What happens there? So that's one part. And the, the, the other side of the equation is, if that were to be happening, what happens to the long tail products or new products or new brands that have always had a cold start problem. Right. Uh, so I'm just very curious to see how Amazon handles those situations. Yeah. You know, I think two, two thoughts along those lines. So first is Amazon has always kind of been a winner takes all or king of the hill is often a term people use where like the best brands get a outside share. Outside share. Um, you know, this was, I think this was, super clear. I mean, back to prime day, you know, the top merchandise deals were the big brands, right? Apple yeah. products, yep. devices. It was like, I mean, that was Amazon basically doing branded searches for you by putting, putting deals right. of brands they knew you knew. Um, the other though, is if you look at the history of, of um, internet advertising, which is about 25 years old, uh, about the same age as Amazon, there's always opportunity when new inventory formats come out sure. because being a first mover to them, others just don't move as quickly. And so you can usually get lower cost inventory. And so I think that's, that's going to be the case with here as it's always been. I mean, there's some recent history examples of this. Um, uh, sponsor brand video, for example, is often really high performing because fewer people have video, video assets and fewer people launch it. And similarly with like, certain parts of DSP, when like new audience stuff comes out, there's always like these arbitrage opportunities in the new stuff. And, and so that's a big part of our philosophy is like, at least be early to the new stuff, because that's where you tend to get the good value, where there's a little bit more arbitrage. Like if the giant companies are already there, it's going to be really hard to compete as a little company. And so being first to a lot of the newer data, the newer audiences, the new inventory, like new terms that come online as stuff starts to trend is really important. Makes sense. Yeah, it'll be exciting to see how this evolves. Yeah, well, we certainly will be keeping a close eye playing with it. <laughs> I've got my, uh, the, the Amazon app on everyone's phones at home. So we'll see, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, perhaps a separate uh, uh, topic for conversation later in the year. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So post Prime Day, to be honest, like running an Amazon channel feels like a long marathon and the prime day shows up. It's a quick sprint and then you're back <laughs> to the marathon. <laughs> As we all know, you know, 
Prime Day is over last week, but the impacts of Prime Day last for a long time. Comments or advice to brands on what should they be thinking about, especially around either the people they have already acquired during Prime Day or folks that may have been shopping their products but haven't yet bought. What are some you know, two to three strategies that brands should think about and execute uh, now that we're in post-Prime Day mode? Sure, sure. So yeah, I think one of the ways that we actually get around uh, profitability that we mentioned before is... Uh, your accounting for Prime Day is actually like a at least a month exercise of the money you invest in lead-in and performance on those days actually returns in cumulative traffic and sales increases and retention increases from those big days. So that's like big picture. What does that actually mean tactically? So Prime Day is generally a spike in new people seeing your products. Um, for the first time generally. There's both people who visit your pages and didn't buy, and then people who visit your pages and, and purchased. And so what we try to do is think about, one, how do we engage and cultivate people who bought our product who are new to the product portfolio? Can we cross sell to them? Can we look at what our typical consumption curve is and resell to them once that um, hits with like remarketing ads and so forth using DSP ads and things like that. Um, and then um, people who visit your page but didn't check out. We're actually running lead out promotions right now. The the FOMO I mentioned of the bedtime scrollers, it yep. persists. Like yep. um, we're, we're sending our email list saying, hey, did you miss Prime Day? We still have deals running. <laughs> because there's a lot of people with products in cart they didn't check out. Or yep. they they were busy and they couldn't. And are you doing uh, that through uh, DSP? Are you doing that through DSP? Or we we do we do kind of all of the above. So if you have email lists or social lists, it's good to yep. push those because some of the people saw this, um, you know, saw Prime Day there uh, on DSP. We like to make discrete retargeting audiences just from Prime Day because they tend to look and operate differently than your kind of like generalized retargeting audience. Sure, um, and so. Uh, harvesting those and similar, similarly with uh, the repurchase remarketing lines. Um, yeah. We primarily use DSP. Occasionally we'll use some of the um, sponsor display options. We find DSP to be a little bit robust. We really like to do things like drive up new to brand as much as possible. Make sure you're not hitting those consumers with other of your DSP lines, which is pretty hard to do on the uh, sponsor display console. So yeah, I guess, I guess to summarize, new retargeting lines, new remarketing lines, lead out promo. But then I guess the, the last thing is, generally, if you had a good Prime Day, you see a spike in BSR. BSR, okay. Yep. A drop, like yeah. drop in BSR. <laughs> yes, yes, a positive spike, I guess. A drop positive spike, <laughs> yes. You're, you're getting, you're ranking better in your category. And what that means is you tend to have more free traffic from Amazon because Amazon is they split the pie of traffic in your category. They allocate it proportionally to where you sit in rank. Yeah. And so you're getting more traffic now. And what happens is basically your, your rank is decaying back to equilibrium in theory because mm -hmm. you have this spike. Yeah. You can imagine that the new traffic in mass is a little bit less relevant than your core traffic. Sure. So your conversion is a little bit lower and your rank drops until it's back to equilibrium. Now, your challenge as a brand is to look at those numbers and say, how much higher are we right now? And what can we do to sustain that rank exactly. as much as possible, right? And so that's also another reason why lead out's really important. Coupons, things like that, they spike your conversion. They let you sit a little bit longer. And if you can sit a little bit longer, you're going to catch the um, that that spike in traffic longer for for weeks, maybe even a month or two. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and on the topic of measurement, I mean, obviously we here are big proponents of using Amazon Marketing Cloud. Uh, we evangelize that a lot. I think that, I mean, this was available, available last year too, but certainly this ability to track this cohort of people, whether they are people that bought from you on Prime Day or people that, and then track them to see what happens over the next 12 months of those users. Um, perhaps get to this question of profitability on those deals you ran uh, is now a possibility. So we are certainly encouraging all our clients to be 
leveraging AMC to go answer those questions that were that are otherwise a little bit difficult to answer. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think well, well <clears throat> I, we built this model probably four or five years ago, which is like, what are the impacts from yeah. uh, from Prime Day? So you have in day sales, then you have cumulative traffic increases. Mm -hmm. Then you have repeat purchase from your new purchasers. Yep. And then we also use like a momentum kicker, which mm -hmm. is like, okay, you, if you get a, if, if you have a meaningful um, increase in rank, your, your month over month momentum tends to increase. And that actually lets you kind of, it's, it's not a perfect model, but it lets you break down a framework for like, yeah. what is the total cumulative ROI on your prime day deal? And you can actually just make, put numbers to it. It's like, I'm going to spend this Makes much sense. on discounts and get this much in sales, convert it to net profit. And then, so, so like, say you spent five grand, but then repeat purchase gets you this retargeting from that new traffic gets you that. And then lifetime, average lifetime value of these new purchasers gets you um, this total cumulative value. And frankly, I mean, I love this model, by the way. And frankly, it's like, it's probably a repeatable model for all 10 poll events, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. there's Prime Day, there's Turkey 5, there's Easter, there's, there's just and especially depending on the brand, there is other events as well, right? So, um, right, yeah, love this model. Anything we have not talked about, Chris? You know, I think. Let me think. Let me think. I think we we talked about a lot of stuff. One <laughs> thing that one thing that I did uh, <clears throat> I did note that's kind of interesting is repeat purchase and lifetime value and. Um, subscriptions is like generally a rising star at Amazon. So mm, mm, mm. it used to be that this was like one of the bigger uh, criticisms of valid criticisms of Amazon that you could really drive lifetime value on your own website, but it's harder to drive on Amazon. But slowly but surely, Amazon has released a lot of tools that drive repeat. Um, subscribe and save coupons. There's retention analytics, repeat purchase analytics, and benchmarks that they give. I mean, um, we do some of our own analytics based on uh, transaction data, um, which you which you should also do. But there's just like a lot more <clears throat> data, and then of course, um, subscription coupons. A lot of stuff of customer engagement emails related to posts also yeah. is all related to repeat purchase. So it's clear that inside Amazon, there's a strategic push on. Hey, we can actually increase repeat value, which is probably cheaper than net new acquisition. The thing that was notable this year was um, Amazon on, on your homepage, when you pulled up your phone or your browser on Prime Day, they put at one of the top spots, buy it again, deals from brands you've bought before. That's right. right. <clears throat> and, and that's super interesting because, you know, again, like, time bound new brand discovery was like prime yep. in the past like join yep. the auction and and now it's like hey restock on the thing you buy and <laughs> there's a deal there's a deal going i think you can kind of start to extrapolate of like what does this mean is amazon looking for like easier to convert revenue to to juice their prime day because they, they know they have to beat last year's number but overall i think Focusing on retention and lifetime value is a really good strategy for brands. It's a, it's a slow burn. It takes work um, to do so, but it's one of the, it's one of the the better ways that you can increase profitability long term. Hundred percent, and especially given the fact that there's more levers to drive those things, and there is more measurement capability to drive those things. So, um, absolutely. Well, awesome. Well, Chris, this has already been extremely informative, certainly for me, <laughs> uh, educational as well. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, and also, you know, there's a lot more to be done the rest of the year, I'm sure, for your brands. Uh, wish you all the best. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Awesome. Thanks for having me. It was great chatting.